Okay, so this is a, you're in the Meet the Fed 2.0 panel. So how many people in the audience are feds that will admit it? Yeah. What a coincidence, that's, that's really strange. How many are foreign spies? <laughs> how many here are doing counter intel on the, no. Um, so, so the genesis of this panel uh, was the old Meet the Fed panel that we've had for many years and it was very successful. And for a number of scheduling reasons and some screw ups and everything, um, that panel didn't happen this year. But it was perfect because I wanted to try something new. I wanted to try sort of a Meet the Fed 2.0. So I wanted to get the guys actually running the investigations, the guys with the badges and the guns and the arrest authority and people that are chasing down, you know, looking at packet logs, to actually tell us like, hey, what, what's it really like? What's going on? You know, do you sleep at all? Do you fly all over the country? What's it like to actually be trying to protect these networks? And, um, and so I got my friend here, Darren, um, who I met when he wasn't uh, in the OSI, and then later on he went back. He, he was an agent. He thought that private industry might be for him, and then you were like, um, I'm running back. So he's back, and, um, and he knows everybody. He's, his nickname is uh, The Mayor. Yep, see, it's out. It's out, man. Um, and he's assembled a great team of guys uh, representing different agencies who are active, and he's going to kind of do a little interaction with them. We have a microphone up here for questions. We want to make this very just transparent, ask whatever's on your mind uh, after everybody kind of gives a background. And, uh, and that's about it. It's pretty simple. It's straightforward. And I want to introduce uh, Darren. So uh, come on up here, man. Thanks, sir. Appreciate it. Yep. Thank you, Jeff. Well, thank you all for coming to Meet the Fed 2.0. As Jeff said, I'm Darren Harvickson, and I'm an OSI special agent. I've been in OSI for 16 years, spent a year out in the corporate world, and, uh, and came back uh, about a year and a half ago. So I appreciate the opportunity to uh, change a little bit uh, on how we interact with, uh, with DEF CON in a federal agent context. But um, as Jeff said, this is something new. And, and if you have worked with federal agents at all, you know we don't beta test stuff. So we're winging this. And uh, it's either going to crash or succeed. So, uh, but it's going to be up to you on whether it succeeds. It's based on uh, interaction with the audience. And so once we get into the panel discussion, if you would, uh, think of good questions to ask current operators uh, about uh, their job and how they, how they go about being federal agents. So, so what's the agenda? We're going to start out first in, uh, in line with tradition and start out with a game. And then we're going to go into the panel. But the game that we used to play in Meet the Fed was uh, uh, called Spot the Lamer, but uh, I changed it up a little. I want to do a, a legit Spot the Fed. So what we're going to do is have uh, four individuals come up to the stage, and one of them is actually a, a current operator. And uh, then we're going to have four uh, volunteers from the audience who want to say, really cool shirt that says I spotted the Fed, um, ask questions, and one of those four, whoever picks the, uh, the real Fed will get a shirt. So let's, start, let's kick that off, but uh, before we kick that off, we have to sort of define what a Fed is. A Fed in our context is a federal agent with a badge gun running cyber operations and investigations. A, uh, as DEF CON got popular and as hackers um, got together and, and conspired to, uh, to overflow buffers. Uh, agents have, uh, have always wanted to be in that mix to, to figure out what the hackers were doing. So as a practical matter, hackers had to sort of um, judge their audience who they're hanging out with, and they wanted to spot the federal agent. And uh, it's now evolved into sort of a game and it's a game that we're going to play now. So, if Billy, if you could uh, bring up our, 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 our supposed agents. So come on up here, stand next to Jeff. And uh, come on up here, stand right next to Jeff. And, uh, and maybe he'll even shake your hand and be nice. Come on, stand right here, please. So now I need four volunteers from the audience that want a shirt. So Billy, if you would help me out there, make sure they don't 
you know, they're not already like feds. If you could stand over here by the mic, that'd be great. Yeah, no, sir, sir, you could, yeah, the girls are up here, no, uh-uh. Um, yeah, right over there by the mic. So stand right there. So this, this is how it's gonna work. You guys get one question and you get to ask them, <clears throat> hey, yeah, girls, yeah, no, o over here, guy. Sir, over here? Yeah, there you go. <laughs> He's excited. He wanted to be the um, So you guys get one question, and you get to ask, ask the ladies one question, and they all have to answer that one question. And then when you all four are done with your one question, then uh, you get to tell Billy who you think the Fed is. And if one of you is right, you win. If you're all wrong, then you get to ask another question. Is that cool? Easy, right? So who's first? What kind of question? Uh, you can ask anything. They're authorized to lie, and you and. And so you can ask whatever you want to ask. Are you a Fed? <laughs> okay. No. 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 Yeah. Okay. Next. <laughs> Have you ever studied non-Morse intercepts? No. No. I'd rather not. <laughs> what did you guys want to be when you grew up? When you were little? What did you guys always want to do when you grew up when you were little? Like, what was your, what was your dream job? What did you want to be when you were growing up? A princess. Princess, yeah, that's good. A doctor. A school counselor. A pilot. Okay. Um, we can't hear him. One was a princess, one was a doctor. School counselor. School counselor. Pilot. Pilot. Who is your favorite president? <laughs> so here. Tough call. Clinton. Reagan. Clinton. Okay. So do you guys have a? Uh, do you have an idea who it is? So tell Billy in private, and then. Uh, Come over here. You can tell me over here. And then we'll see if we have a winner. No, you got to commit, man. No, you don't point. <laughs> okay. So that wasn't private either. Never. Okay, so why don't you go and talk to Billy in private. Okay, next. Thinking, thinking. Okay, do we have a winner? Two winners. Okay. So let's let's have let's see if the audience is as good as uh, our two winners. Okay, I'll carry it. I'm not going to. Okay, I'm going to get behind our contestants. And uh, so, audience, uh, this one. What's that? Okay. Just this show of hands, so let's do that. Show of hands. Okay. This young lady. Okay. Ma'am. Oh. Oh. Wow. Okay. How about this young lady? Wow. Wow. Okay. So. Ask which one why, Jeff. Why are they so positive on those two? I can see your handcuffs. Maybe that's a bad idea. <laughs> Posture, handcuffs, um, facial expressions, answers. Well, 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 guess what? Guess what? The majority of you, the ones who picked her, were wrong. No, no wonder why we are so successful here. So, um, if I could have uh, my two winners come up here.
Yeah, I'm not Britney Spears. I don't know how to do this. <laughs> so, uh, so why did you pick who you picked? Uh, I asked why, what they want to be when they grew up, and she said a pilot, so that was a red flag military. Absolutely. What about you? Uh, when I asked who was president, I knew that uh, this was a, a plant. So <laughs> <laughs> I knew Reagan was going to be a plant. Oh, yeah, really? Okay, that's good. Well, I like Reagan. Well, <laughs> if, you, if you would, Amanda, step up. <laughs> this, this is Amanda. Amanda is a currently, she's currently an OSI agent. She's running some of our most significant ops and uh, um, is here to represent OSI, and thank you so much. Um, you don't get to go yet. So what's your name, by the way? Patrick Wright. Thanks for playing, man. I got a shirt for you. Uh, Van. Okay. And ladies, thank you so much for playing. I really appreciate it. Thanks. Yeah. Thank you. And in tradition, the, uh, the, the folks that spotted the Fed get a shirt that says, I spotted the Fed, and then the Fed gets a shirt that says, I am the Fed. <laughs> so, thank you, Amanda, appreciate it. Good sport. Oh, you can talk to yeah. yeah, me. Yeah. So now we get into the panel, and thank you so much, Jeff. But now we get into the panel discussion. The panel discussion is really you. Um, you get to uh, interact with a federal agent. If you've never done that before, it can be, uh, um, it can be an experience. But uh, if, think about it as uh, if you're introduced to these young men for the first time and you wanted to ask them a question, um, approach it like that. But what I'm going to ask them to do individually is introduce themselves, introduce uh, what agency they're from, and maybe <coughs> talk about their mission a little bit. And then uh, once we're done with that, I'll open it up for questions. So think about good questions, and we'll start off with Adam. Sir. Yes, my name is Adam, and I'm an investigator for the Air Force, Office of Special Investigations. And uh, I've been with the Air Force now about 10 years, been with uh, investigations for about half that. And uh, I'm an uh, active service member, uh, very proud of my military service. Uh, very happy uh, for all of you in the audience that are uh, service members, government, active duty, uh, civilians, reservists, etc. I see a lot of you out there, um, and I just thank you for all your service. I'm very proud to uh, serve alongside you, whether we've worked together or not. Uh, I thank you, and uh, I look forward to our dialogue this morning. So. My name is Ahmed. I'm with uh, NASA's Computer Crime Division uh, in Southern California. We're in Pasadena. Um, I've been with NASA for just a little over a year now. Before that, uh, I spent uh, just under a decade in the Air Force. Um, half of that time uh, with OSI, where I actually worked with, uh, with Adam and Darren uh, for, for a few years. Um, our, uh, our mission area is a typical computer crime uh, uh, mission set. You know, the, the computer intrusions, uh, child exploitation cases, uh, typical forensic support to, to white collar crime type cases. Uh, we, we, we do it all out of our shop. And I, I'd say most of our time, uh, is spent uh, investigating computer intrusions, which is probably of most interest to most of you in the room, so uh, we can chat about that uh, as you wish. Glad to be here. Uh, my name is Adam as well. I'm with NCIS out of Washington State. Uh, I've been with NCIS for about five years, and prior to that I was with the U.S. Customs Service as a special agent, which has now become uh, DHS ICE. Um, I just got back from a couple years overseas where I focused mainly on criminal forensics, not so much the network side, uh, any child pornography, fraud, uh, you died suspiciously, we went through your computer, try to figure that out. Uh, now I'm back here in the States and starting to get into the uh, network intrusion side. Uh, my name is Ryan. Uh, I'm uh, the Assistant Special Agent in charge for Army CID's Digital Forensics and Research Branch with our Computer Crime Investigative Unit. Uh, much like these guys, uh, we are very uh, network intrusion heavy, but we do a lot of uh, other things involving all manner of uh, things that are of interest to uh, the Army and Department of Defense from uh, child exploitation to uh, human trafficking to terrorism to all kinds of things. So uh, we um, have an investigative mission, but uh, we also uh, do a lot of our own uh, forensic stuff, the bits and the bites. We're kind of a one-stop shop. Um, we're 
kind of unique in the Army in, in that way where we uh, are the only ones that have a law enforcement mandate that do both the investigation and the uh, forensic examination as well. So I'm very happy to be here. Thank you. Thank you, gentlemen. And you may recognize Adam from NCIS from his cameos on the show. Proby. Yeah, good. So uh, now it's your turn. Anybody have any questions? Let's kick this off. Okay, sir, please step up to the mic. Say your name, where you're from, and uh, ask your question. I'm Tyler. I'm a student at University of Berkeley. Um, I noticed when you were describing your job description, the first thing almost all of you mentioned was child exploitation. Um, is this like the main priority when it comes to your divisions, and is this true across all federal agencies? I guess I can start. Um, uh, within the Air Force, I mean, we uh, have a very limited number of uh, computer or cyber skilled specialists that conduct investigations. And really, uh, you know, support to general crimes is actually one of our lower priorities. We probably dedicate very limited resources to doing that just because the, the growth of, you know, intrusion activity and the damage that that causes to our network. So uh, that's probably becoming each year less and less something that's on our score within the Air Force. Um, you know, you guys can definitely talk to what your entities are doing. I don't know if you're doing any of that. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I would say, you know, obviously child exploitation cases are important because uh, the folks that are doing that type of stuff uh, need to be caught and need to be put behind bars. Uh, and, and we, we kind of refrain from saying what's a, a bigger priority than, than something else. I mean, it really just depends on the caseload. Um, and we try not to push stuff away. So th the only reason I mentioned the majority of our work is in the computer intrusion arena is because that's where the majority of the work is, not because we let it bubble to the top as a bigger priority. So, um, you know, if, if the, if the caseload is, you know, five child exploitation cases in one computer intrusion case, so be it. If it's the other way around, so be it. It just depends on uh, what activity, uh, what activity services and, uh, and how many, you know, agents we have assigned to what stuff. But it's not, uh, it's certainly not something that we say, oh, you know, we don't have time to run that case because we're doing this because they are important cases as well. Uh, very similar, you know, we, it, it's, a, it's a grab bag cases, whatever we get, we get. Unfortunately, that is not a, a rare crime, and it goes across the scope of all our agencies. Uh, prior, when I was with Customs, I was in a group solely devoted to child exploitation, and that was beyond just, you know, looking at pictures on the internet. Those were people actively traveling to foreign countries to, uh, to do things with minors. Um, unfortunately, it's, it's, it's just as popular as it was 10 years ago. It's just a crime that doesn't go away, and uh, so I think we all devote a, a fair amount of time to that. Uh, it's, it's the same for us. Uh, my particular division, we focus on the intrusions, but we do have digital forensic examiners that are spread out uh, across the country, well, across the world, uh, really, uh, that see uh, a lot more of the child exploitation stuff, particularly the child pornography. Um, one of the things about that crime in particular is that it gets a lot of public attention. Um, it causes a lot of public outcry. It, it, it really gets um, a lot of media focus. So when you talk about something that pays the bills, so to speak, um, that's one of the ones that people like to focus on. And, and the reason for it is because, you know, when you look at one hand, you know, we're taking uh, people that are actively preying on children, creating child pornography, sharing it around the world, and contributing to this type of victimization versus, uh, well, you know, we got uh, a Romanian hacker uh, that broke into a Department of Defense web server. I mean, people the general public uh, tends to care a little bit more about one uh, than the other. As far as an agency priority, um, like the others, we, do, we don't really uh, prioritize our crimes like that. We take uh, what we've got, but it does receive a great deal of focus. And I, I guess if I can just add, as far as priorities, it's not that it's less of a priority for my agency as a whole, more less of a priority for our cyber specialists because we're kind of constrained in terms of our efforts. So we're pushing those types of cases just to general agents and trying to get their cyber skill sets more, you know, more advanced so that they can still take that mission forward. So. Thank you very much for your question. Appreciate it. Thank you for your answer. Thanks. Yeah. Yeah, thank you very much. Very good question. Ma'am. wondering how you got into the career. Were you computer scientists first and then you got recruited? Were you like law or justice majors and then you got trained? It's a very good question, but uh, what's your name and where you're from? Uh, Linda Butler. Um, 
been around. Where are you from? <laughs> yeah. That's a hard question for some people. Uh, you had I my kind of night last night then, because I don't know where I'm from right now, but. <laughs> so, please. Uh, guys, do you mind if I start with this one? Cool. Yes. You know, there's a, there's a real big debate uh, in our field in general, particularly uh, federal law enforcement for guys that do the cyber stuff. Is it easier to take a cop and turn him into a cyber guy, or is it easier to take an IT person or somebody who's a computer scientist and turn him into a good cyber cop? Um, you know, it's kind of like a glass is half full or half empty debate. You know, less filling tastes great. Um, it's one of those things that, it, and I'd like to ask the fellow panel members as you go down, I'd like to hear your opinion on that. Um, our consensus has generally been it's easier to take someone who was a cop or had a law enforcement background and turn them into a cyber guy because you can teach the cyber stuff and it's a little tougher to teach some of the, um, you know, the intuition stuff, the following from point A to point B and being able to make that intuitive leap from B to D, you know, without going through C. Um, that, that, uh, but it, it's probably a product of where a lot of us came from. Um, I, I was a cop first, I was a street cop. Uh, started out um, in the military. Thought there had to be more than just writing speeding tickets. Um, and uh, by then, I had already uh, gotten a grad degree and a few other things and, and wanted to, to move up and move on. Um, so I started looking at investigations, very quickly uh, got focused on forensic science uh, in particular, uh, and then uh, computer and digital forensics. Uh, after that was kind of how I got sucked in and decided that was where I wanted to make the rest of my career. Cool. On the same note, um I come from a law enforcement family. I was going to be a cop. Uh, I didn't go to school for it. I went to school, got a degree in psychology. Um, I've been kind of geeky, but by comparison, I'm not so hot when I'm here. Um, you know, I got into law enforcement and I started doing just regular general crimes, custom, you know, people smuggling dope, um, all sorts of things. And kitty porn cases came up, and, and like we discussed, those are pretty prevalent. I uh, got my, my feet wet there and doing the forensics, and I've, I've always been involved in computers and interested in technology. And I got into it there, and I got a little more involved. Um, on the same note as you know, turning a cop into an IT guy, um, all of us, I think, uh, are the same. We also have, you know, we're special agents. We have this job code. We also have other job codes, uh, at least with NCIS. We have computer scientists. We have uh, investigative computer specialists. Things that we bring to the table, we may not be computer geniuses, but what we bring to the table is we can go outside the office, go to your house, do the arrest, do the search. We, have, we bring a law enforcement angle to it. So we may not be the be all end all when it comes to the computer investigations, but we also have other positions. Mm -hmm. um, so if you don't want to go out there and you know, go through people's underwear in their house <laughs> and, and things like that, there, there are other positions that you do the behind the keyboard kind of stuff and you're doing the investigations from that side. Um, but one of the benefits uh, is that we can go outside and knock on doors and talk to people. So your, your vote is cop first? To a degree. <laughs> There's a lot uh, of take people. Take a stand, man. <laughs> yes. Okay. Yeah. To I, a degree. I, I don't know where, where I'd uh, vote on that poll. I, I think, uh, you know, I, I think you just need to be a geek that knows how to talk to people, honestly. And whether that comes as, uh, you know, if you were a cop first or if you were a geek first, uh, I'm not sure that, and in my mind, I don't think that matters too much. I mean, you have to have a passion for law enforcement. You have to have a passion for computer science or this industry. And if you have both of those things, um, you know, if you want to catch bad guys, you like computers, whichever one comes first is, uh, it, it, I think is relevant personally. I mean, because we, we have, and I'm sure Army does, I'm sure NCIS does, and I know OSI does, um, we have a little bit of both. We have a little bit of the, the geeks that became cops and then the cops that became geeks or nerds or, or whatever word you want to use. Um, I, I, didn't, I don't have a background as, as a street cop first. My first um, introduction to law enforcement was being a computer crime investigator, being an agent with OSI uh, while I was in the Air Force. So um, my undergrad is in computer engineering, my master's is in computer science. You know, resume wise, I'm probably the geek, um, but I like to talk to people. And, uh, and, and, and I think that's the, that's the key skill set that you need to have outside of the geek right. stuff is, is, is communication. like communication skills, absolutely. Yeah, I think I'll win favor with the audience if I say, you're way better off if you're a geek first. Uh, I guess I was one as well, so uh, score one for me. But um, no, uh, I came from an IT background. I did enterprise, net ops, and, and security. Um, and then uh, through a friend of mine who you know, was with uh, the Air Force uh, investigations, uh, she pulled me in and I heard about it, and uh, I've been thrilled you know, doing this work ever since. Um, but really part of it, and it kind of piggybacks on what a lot of people have said is, 
when I look at how we shape our force, uh, you, there's no cookie cutter process. Really, we need people from a variety of backgrounds and expertise. So, you know, if I can get that guy that, uh, you know, has codes in a closet, uh, he may that be that team member that I need, but then there may be some guy that's just been a great street cop that balances that team out. And so, um, you know, you, you can't always just say it's one way, one path. Um, we need people from all over the spectrum of, of geek, of law enforcement, of just creative thinkers. Um, people skills generally are a must, um, being able to work with people and uh, accomplish the mission through uh, support. I mean, the reality is in law enforcement, I mean, we rely on the relationships we build to get our things done. There's just way too much stuff for us to work and we rely on a lot of you to help us and uh, having those people skills uh, really make that happen, so. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your question. Thank you. So I'm Carney, I'm from Florida. Um, when you're told to do a task that you morally disagree with, how do you handle that? I haven't been in that situation yet, so. Okay, if you were told to do a task that you morally disagree with, <laughs> how would you handle that? Um, you know, some, something that you morally object to, I think you, you I think in any, I don't think the law enforcement aspect to it uh, is, is any more or less relevant than just anything you do, any job you have. Uh, you can work at Starbucks and be asked to do something that's, you know, that, sh that, that you object to, so um, I would say you, Obviously, try not to do it and try to talk your way through it with your supervisor so that you're not put in that position again. I don't know if anybody else has any other thoughts on that. You know, there's, there's plenty, of, plenty of avenues um, for people that work with the government if they find themselves in a morally gray situation or something that they don't uh, agree with. Like, um, Ahmed, I haven't been placed in that position yet, but uh, there's whistleblower laws, uh, protections a lot of time, um, and my agency is spent on um, informing uh, employees about uh, courses that they can take if, if they're asked to do something that, that they don't feel is right or um, they learn of something that they feel is um, criminal or morally objectionable um, and ensuring that the employees are empowered to make the right decisions for themselves within um, the, the legal and regulatory framework of the federal government. Thank you. Thank you. And if I can address that question briefly, you could probably ask that question in any conference, in any, any venue, um, and you probably get similar answers. Moral, morality is uh, pretty much a personal choice, right? But as, as law enforcement officers, we uh, um, also you know, have a, a, a code of professionalism that's based on uh, our individual uh, organizations, and uh, we uphold those uh, professional ideals. And so. Uh, morality is a personal choice, and, and we have the same venues for remedy in that uh, uh, environment as any other as any other workforce. So, thank you again, sir. Name and where you're from. My name is Expro, and I'm from New Brunswick, Canada. And my question is, uh, as cyber agents for each of your divisions, do you work with? and informant base, and how would that differ from a traditional, that of a traditional field agent, if you do work with one? Hmm, that's a good question. Uh, we, we do work with informants. Uh, it's actually not that different uh, than a traditional field agent. Um, one of the things that we experience a little bit more than probably the average uh, you know, general crimes agent at one of our outlying offices is we don't always have quite as much face-to-face -face interaction uh, with the folks that uh, come to our attention or or become uh, informants sometimes because of the nature of what we do. You know, sometimes we meet these folks online um, and typically there's um, some sort of an interface that goes just beyond, you know, like chatting uh, on the on the net because it's difficult to verify identities and things. But um, we we do uh, talk to and uh, recruit uh, informants from all all over the place, not only um, in what you would uh, consider uh, criminal elements, but also you know regulatory agencies, federal employees, um, corporate America, just uh, all over the place. Uh, sometimes they come to us, sometimes we go to them. It just depends. And on that note, you know, since representing a lot of the military organizations, we have locations overseas, different countries, uh, and again, 
our cyber divisions in each one of our agencies are just a small faction of, of our entire agency. So we might have one person who covers 10 states or two countries or five countries. Um, so going back to what he said, the same thing. You know, if you're in California, but you're the next nearest guy to somebody in Utah, there's, you know, we have people who have sources in different states and it's mostly electronic communication. I think that's the big difference is just, you know, with a, a standard informant, you're meeting them face to face and exchanging things with us, just using technology, doing it online. Yeah, the only thing I'd add to that, and I, I know we don't, we don't each need to answer every single question because we're going to run out of time quick, but um, is usually our informants are usually good guys. I mean, if you, if you compare the, the type of informants that, say, uh, you know, somebody that works drug cases has, um, and not to say that the, all the informants in the drug world are bad guys, there's good guys there too, but typically they, they kind of have somewhat of a, a, you know, embattled history with drugs or access to drugs or those sorts of things. Um, whereas a lot of times in our case, I mean, the, the informants are just good guys that have access to information or that are willing to help. Um, and they don't, they, they don't have to be criminals and they never were criminals and they never will be criminals. Um, so that's probably the only distinction I'd make with, in, in, in the cyber world is that the majority of our informants are good guys, too. Thanks. Thank you. Appreciate it. Sir. Uh, Jeff from Rochester, New York. I go to RIT. What's up, Chuck? My question is, why would you choose government or federal work over doing federal contracting for like a third party? Like, why would you choose that? Well, my wife asks me that every day. Um, <laughs> uh, it's going back to the, the question the young lady asked earlier, you, you just have to have a passion for what you do. And I think all of us standing up here, in addition to having a passion for you know, this industry, we have a passion for law enforcement, and it's kind of hard to, I think most, some of us have tried it. I mean, I, I did try the, the private sector for a while, and I, and I enjoyed it. Um, it. It was good work, but I, I was never personally as, you know, satisfied professionally or personally as I was when I was working in the law enforcement arena. It's just, uh, it's, it's, it's more of a passion than anything else. I mean, I suppose the, the money could be more or less, you know, really depends on, on the job or the, the type of job you have, but um, if, if, you're, if you're asking, you know, when you mentioned federal contracts, I don't, for me, it's not necessarily the stability or the security of the government versus federal contracts, because quite frankly, uh, if any of you have been watching the news lately, the government really isn't that stable right now. I mean, there's a lot of money problems that are going on and budget issues that, that quite frankly scare me a little bit. Um, and so I'm, I'm not sitting in the seat because it's a steady paycheck. I'm sitting in the seat because it's, it's, the, uh, it's the line of work that I have a passion to do. The contractor's positions just don't give me a gun, so that's my yeah. reason. <laughs> <laughs> that too. <laughs> no, uh, you know, being active duty, I love the people I work with, and uh, I mean, that's a big part of it. Nothing against contractors. I work with a lot of phenomenal contractors as well, and, uh, you know, they're a part of the team. Um, I just, I'm, I'm proud of my military service, and, uh, you know, you got to weigh those options. There's advantages and disadvantages. Uh, there's headaches in working for the government and the bureaucracy that we deal with and uh, you know So you kind of got to weigh what what your interests are and what your uh, you know what you need best for for the life that you want so. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you Sir uh, my name is Nick. I'm from San Diego. And, cool. Uh, thank Ooh, you for San Diego. I appreciate it I guess. Thank you. Um, so my question is kind of, uh, it's kind of on the edge, and I apologize, um, but it's in regards to child pornography, which I think um, like publicly and statistically has kind of exploded, or for the most part. Um, now, like, I, I assume when you know, a police officer you know, finds like, a, a meth dealer or a cokehead, they don't have to like, physically you know, get down there and take a line to, uh, to find out it's cocaine. You know, there's labs and whatnot for that. But for I mean, child pornography, it's in regards to like a conviction, how do you how do you go about doing that? I just I would assume you have to expose yourself or a team to like a mass quantity of that. We do. We see a lot of it. Um, when I was with Customs, I was I, I think we were the first class. They started instituting a um, at least annual kind of well-being check to make yeah. sure that it wasn't affecting your life. And I know a lot of uh, <clears throat> smaller. Uh, like police departments, local police departments, and other investigative agencies have started doing that. Um, I know some places they limit it. You can only do it for two, three years, and you have to get out. Uh, you can't make a career out of it in those places. Um, a lot of it, you know, it, it's, it's difficult. Um, you do see a lot. Um, but you kind of you kind of got to separate yourself from the situation, uh, especially like in our line of business, you know, when you're dealing with counterfeiting or currency cases or dope cases. 
Like when you see $20 million, you don't see that as $20 million. There's no temptation to like, hey, I could take five bucks, put it in my pocket. Because it's, it's evidence. You know, you, you kind of got to remove yourself from that situation and say that is, that's not money, that's just evidence. And you kind of have to do that with the child pornography. Um, and I mean, legally, you guys, I mean, is there like things, a process you have to go through, things you have to sign? I mean, because, I mean, it's, it's almost redundant at that point. Like, you know, you're taking one thing from an area and, you know, you're putting in another one. I know it's for the greater good, but it's still... There's a... Uh, I don't mean to take these guys, but, you know, I've done a decent amount of those cases. There's, there's definitely a process, legal process, you know. Um, the, in the legal process, if you're convicted or you're defendant in these cases, you know, you're, you have the right to a defense. So there's, there's ways and there's legalities to sh giving you access to the evidence, because if you're in a dope case or some other case, your defense team has, has to have access to the evidence to review it to come up with a proper defense. Um, but there are a lot of legalities. It's not so much just signing something. It's uh, access access control, um, where they can view it, how much they can view it. Um, I know there's that case in the news of the guy who's defending himself from, I forget what state, but he's defending himself and he gets to look at his own child porn again, and that's kind of the odd duck, you know, it's yes. not the everyday thing. It, um, is, it is considered contraband, if that's what you're asking. Right. I mean, it's definitely controlled. Uh, yeah. it's, it's not something that's just kind of hanging around in the office that everybody can see. Uh, you know, the, the, the process, the analysis, the forensics on, on the box, um, clearly articulating and showing what is considered child pornography, what's not. Um, some, some of that determination has already been made for us. There's uh, repositories of hash values out there that of known images that have already been analyzed over and over and over again, so you don't have to dig through the image and uh, get three or four different <coughs> experts to look at it and say whether or not you know, the, the, the individual in the image is underage or not. That, that's already been done. And so a lot of times it's just you know, matching a value that's, that's in a repository that's, that's already been done. Uh, a, a bunch of times, and, and if that's if the count is high enough on those, um, and you have enough for a conviction, then you know obviously you still need to treat the other stuff and get the other stuff entered in the system. But you're not actually in most cases you're not taking those images and transferring those images to a repository. You're usually dealing with the hash values of those images. Okay. So you're not just sending child porn all over the place. And, and as far as recent years, um, from like an actual reliable source, is is it the contraband itself on the decline, or is it still rising? Uh, in, like, say, the United States. You wouldn't happen to be a reporter, would you? No, no, because, no. Because no. you've, you've, got, the, really you've got the four question syndrome going on. Uh, well, <laughs> no, I'm, you can ask a lighter question if you like. I'm, I'm just messing with you, but please, go ahead. You know, just, just real quick, I'm, I'm not aware of the particular statistics, but if we just apply a little common sense thought as, as technology gets better and better, you yeah. know, storage media gets larger and larger, transmission, speeds get faster and faster, it's only reasonable to expect that crimes that depend on those things uh, for their lifeblood, like child pornography and child exploitation, will become more prolific in society. All right, cool. All right, thanks guys. Thanks for everything. No oh, thank you so much. <laughs> Sir. Hello, I'm Wesley from Seattle. Um, uh, yeah, this is a yes or no answer. Um, I think given the, the broad uh, expertise at so go a long way to help me um, with arguments that I have with colleagues and coworkers and whatnot. Um, so, if, in your opinion, if I was a if I was a search engine and I was um, I was uh, collecting a lot of data from the web, and um, it came to the point where I needed to decide uh, whether or not to store content from sites um, that. Uh, they were proud of being um, pre-teen swimsuit models, that's what they did. Or to, so their non-membership areas were, well, we, we do pre-teen swimsuit modeling. Um, in your opinion, yes or no, uh, sorry to put you on the spot like this, but the, the yes or no just resolves a lot of issues for me. Um, would I want to be affiliated with these sites in any way? Would I want to uh, index, index them and be appointed to them? Yes or no? Hmm. I wouldn't. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I think for most of us up here, it's all about the letter of the law. If yeah. you if you read uh, what the law says, what the United yep. States, well, yep. in, in this country, yep. what the United States Code has yep. to say uh, about what's permissible and what's not, yep. um, it either it either, either is or it isn't. Yep. So uh, I, I would take my cue from that because that is what we're all called upon to enforce. Okay. Uh, just, uh, God, just another report. Can I just quickly just follow that one more? So, if, if it was your uh, search engine and you were running it from your home, 
right? Um, given the, the experience that you have, um, and uh, so it's right of admission reserved, I will decide who comes into my index. Would you store that content? So would you be the, the pointer to that? Would you, would you index those sites? From, from your personal experience. Hmm. I, I, I don't know. I've never been put in that situation. That's a hypothetical. I mean, yeah. I, I okay. can't even. Based on everything I've done, I wouldn't want to be associated yeah. with any yeah. okay. thing that's even remotely borderline yeah. suspect child right. pornography. Hey, Wes, I'll give you one, one quick answer on that, just to, because I, I think you kind of want to know our personal opinions as well as. So I'm not a lawyer. I don't try to be a lawyer. And whenever there's that, that you know, fine line of, is this okay to move forward with or not on a case, I always call the lawyer, uh, the, the prosecutors. I don't make those calls myself. But personally, if it were my own company and my business and had absolutely nothing to do with my professional career, I would, I would probably avoid those sites yeah. myself. Super, thank you. Thank Thanks. you, sir, appreciate it. Sir. Hi, I'm Chris from Chicago. Uh, my question is obviously you guys, I don't wanna go back to the child porn thing, but between violent crime or offensive images or whatever else, there's a lot of demands put on you by the job. How do you manage, or how uh, how do you really balance the demands of the job and what you actually go through in the course of your investigations with being a husband or brother or boyfriend or whatever else and having a real life? Yeah, good question. Very good question. Interesting question. I'm going to cry right now, actually. Um, <laughs> um, I got to go call my family. Excuse me. <laughs> just thinking about it and all the things I went through last night, actually, um, in the service of my country. But please. There's, there's always an overwhelming amount of work to be done in this industry and um, I mean you just gotta you gotta have priorities and um, I mean I have a family I'm married and um, I'd love to say that I leave at four every day or that I leave at five every day that does not happen but um, you know I, I make it my priority to get home uh, you know my career goals and things like that are, I don't aspire to you know get to a certain level in the government I aspire to you know retire one day and have a family that uh, I can spend time with and there's people that that sacrifice a lot of that to get their retirement or to get to a stage that they want to be at and uh, you just have to have balance. I mean, I think balance in life is uh, a very important thing and you have to know your priorities and uh, make sure that uh, you kind of keep those uh, in check because uh, I mean, the job, the job pays the bills short term, but it doesn't necessarily take care of, care of you long term, so. Uh, yeah, yeah same, same as Adam. I mean, family man, kids, um, you know, that work-life balance is something that you're, you're always working on and I, and I think everybody deals with that struggle, right? Work, whether you work 10 hours a day, 12 hours a day, 14 hours a day, you, you know, you, you, you have an obligation requirement to, to your job as well as your family. And so just simply on the, in the aspect of, okay, balancing, you know, your professional life and your personal life, everybody does it differently. But specifically, I think what you're asking is, you know, some of the, the day-to-day -day stuff that we the, see. The baggage, do, like the, the bad most stuff, people right? don't see. Right, the baggage, the, 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 the dealing with bad guys, seeing images that would otherwise uh, probably uh, you know, damage you mentally in some regard, um, which I am mentally damaged, I think, at this point. Um, but no, you know, I, I, I try and turn it off. I really do just, I try and get home and turn it off. And it's hard sometimes, it really is, because you're home and you're with your kids and you're playing, and you're watching TV and, you know, you got, the, you know, today's case running through your head. But you just do the best you can like any other thing. I mean, something that I picked up recently, on, it's funny you ask that, is, uh, you know, I, I read so much at work, um, always reading, you know, whether it's investigative information or whether it's professional, you know, material that I, that to, at, not whether it's for the case or to educate myself. Um, I realized just last week that, man, I don't read anything for leisure to just get my mind off of everything. And so uh, I went out and bought a couple of books that have absolutely nothing to do with anything that I'm interested in just to get my mind off of everything else. And, uh, you know, just sit in bed when the kids are asleep and read that helps kind of turn things off as well. Okay. I echo exactly what they said. And as a, as a father, it just makes you, you know, keep a more watchful eye on your kids. That's the only thing that's, I think I've, I've been different. And of course, when they get old enough to use the internet, I'll shut that off. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks very much, guys. I Thanks. appreciate it. Yeah. Hey, thank you very much. Appreciate it. Sir. Hi, I'm RFG from uh, Northern California. I just wanted to know uh, to what extent federal law, in particular 18 U.S.C. 1030, affects what you guys uh, are constrained uh, from doing or, or the extent to which it, it does not constrain you. And I was also curious about your working definition of federal interest computer. 
I, I'm sorry, that last part again. Yeah. I was interested in your definition of federal interest computer, your working definition. Oh, the, the first part, I think, is, is easier to address. Um, the, all of us act within um, the laws uh, that have been passed uh, by, the, by the government and the interpretation of those laws by, by the courts. Um, particularly in our organization, we have a policy that's called CYA. In this case, it's not um, cover your rear, it's consult your attorney, uh, as was brought up before. That is the golden rule in our organization. Everything that comes in goes through uh, a senior counsel for us, and that's to help us as uh, agents and investigators ensure that we're acting uh, within the scope of the laws that exist, whether it be the Constitution or privacy laws or, or uh, whatever the case may be. So um, we take that extremely seriously. Uh, and uh, because all of us also, if we violate those, not only do we run the risk of losing a case, but we also um, open ourselves up to civil liability as well. Um, so there's a great deal of focus uh, on ensuring that we're acting within the law and we're doing everything uh, legally. Someone else want to give a definition of federal interest computing? No, I'll be honest with you. I don't even know what it is. Yeah, I mean, I'm not going to pretend like I do. Can, yeah. can you tell us what it is? Uh, it's, it's part of federal law, basically. 18 U.S.C. 1030 uh, has certain constraints relative to federal interest computers, and the exact definition of that term, I think, is you, open you to interpretation. You mean what constitutes a government computer versus a non-government computer? A federal computer? interest computer under the law. Okay. Uh, Basically, yeah. yeah. What constitutes a computer that you guys are targeting? What 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 constitutes like if, if something, let's say you're 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 doing an investigation and you trace something and it looks like it's on some server in, I'll just I'll just pick some place uh, Singapore. Okay. Um, and it's and it's theoretically or actually possible to, for you guys to penetrate that server in some sense to access it without explicit authorization. Can you then do that, or are you constrained from doing that? No, no, we're, we're, we're not authorized under most criminal code to penetrate any computer, regardless of where it is. Um, you're getting that from, when, when you start talking about that kind of stuff, you, you start talking about some, you know, computer network offensive and act yeah. um, that, that from under 18 USC, um, we can't do. Now what we can do is we, if it's a state side, if it's a US based computer or IP address or whatever, we can get search warrants to effectively get everything on that computer that would be the equivalent of logging in and taking it. Right. Uh, but if it's overseas, then we're at the mercy of the local law enforcement of wherever it is. So if it's in a country that's, uh, that, that's cooperative and, and is willing to help, then, then we can usually gain access to what we need. If it's in a country that doesn't want to help, well then, then um, right, then luck. we're at the, yeah, but I mean, there's, there's international, you know, Interpol and those sorts of things that help with that if it's overseas, but, um, yeah, we're not penetrating anything. We don't, we don't do that. Well, I have to apologize profusely. I really appreciate your questions, but, uh, I didn't come armed today and the goons are getting ready to, to pull us off the stage. So I don't have any other remedy except to leave. Well, hold so. on though. We are going to the Q and A room right down the hall. Make a right out here. Go almost all the way down. It's on your right hand side. You guys will be in that room for almost an hour. Okay, so... I sent some people down there, and just so, just so you know, somebody from the press actually was requested in that room. If anybody in the press wants to go down there, knock yourself out. But I just want to say thank you so much for coming. Um, it's a great opportunity to uh, be able to interact with you, and hope to see you around.